Now the second, um, the second approach to teaching English as a second language, which is a very popular language instructional approach, uh, was called the audiolingual system or approach or method. Uh, ALM, if you want to use the word method with it, or ALA, you don't want to ever use approach. And I often think, you know, what exactly is it on your handout uh, that you, when you download, you'll see there's a bunch of uh, cubicles, okay? Kind of looks like the office or something. Um, And when I see the cubicles, I think about B.F. Skinner because B.F. Skinner was a big um, was a, a big proponent of the audio lingual approach. And if you remember your psychology, B.F. Skinner was a man who who, who taught about uh, training, and he's he's the one that had the the uh, bo the uh, Skinner box where a rat or a, some kind of animal, usually it could be a bird or something, would get reinforcement if it did a certain activity and it would either pick something or push a leather a, a, a lever or something and a little piece of grain would come down so it would get positive reinforcement and then it they got to intermediate intermittent reinforcement if you know they had to push it five times and only got grain sometimes but they'd still do it because they liked having grain um, it's why we play the lottery. We play the lottery maybe one fifty dollars one time five years ago. Keep going back thinking, well, maybe I could win fifty or maybe a hundred and fifty thousand dollars, take care of all my problems. People still go and do it. Uh so it's a behaviorist approach. Um it's not very inspiring. I don't consider it very intellectually uh positive. Um I look at these uh, cubicles and I think of the rat in the maze and B.F. Skinner would put cheese or something at one spot and the rat, after it learned the pattern, it knew go left, go right, go left, 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 go right, 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 and there's the cheese, okay? And it took him so long to learn it and it could be learned. And um, what happened with language instruction is that there was a great need because actually language instruction from the grammar translation approach didn't really change very much for centuries. But the audio lingual approach occurred because we had developed the technology to have tape players and we could get headphones because they were invented in the 30s. And then what happened is after World War II, the United States became involved all over the world and suddenly our personnel, our military, uh, CIA, um, um, they had a mission, just like missionaries have a mission only. Their job was to go to Vietnam or to Korea or to monitor Cuba or to learn Russian. And they had to learn the language and they had to do it quickly because we would be sending a group of personnel to say, um, the Middle East, and, and so they developed the Army uh, Language Institute. I don't know the exact name of it, but it's near Sacramento, California. And people would go there and they would get intense training. And I say the word training. And what did it, what did it uh, consist of? Well, they had the old fashioned big old tape recorders and People would go to live classes and they would repeat and repeat and repeat and get the patterns and the sounds down to where they were at pretty accurate. And so they would learn basic instruction or uh, conversational um, skills as for whatever country they were going to. So they would be able to say things like, where's the enemy? Or, you know, please, we need your cooperation. So that all the personnel would have some skills. Now they complement that with more extensive training, but the purpose of audio lingual was to train people to learn language quickly. Now, 
They used, uh, as I mentioned, they used, they had lab assistants. In fact, these labs, these language labs, uh, were at UNK and at Oklahoma State University and other universities I've been at, and they're pretty much gone now. They're all gone. But uh, they, were, they were considered the state of the art back in the 60s and 70s. People were building these cubicles, and we were going to teach Spanish or whatever. And so you would sit there and listen. And I've got examples in here. If you click on the, I got there, notice the artificiality of the conversation. Some young ladies learning, uh, learning Spanish. I think it's Spanish, or I've got one of, of their languages. And they, they listen, and then you repeat back to the tape player. And actually, the original idea was that you would record them when they, when they speak back, and then the language lab person would listen and correct them. Now, the problem is you'd have 20 people talking at the same time, so you really couldn't do that very efficiently. Um, and it costs a lot of money. You had to build all this furniture. You had to get lab. Uh, you had to have all, the, all these wires. Um, it was quite, quite a, quite a deal. Um, but people thought it, that was the way to teach a language and it's called audio lingual. You listen and then you speak audio lingual. Now, and I always, and I bring the tape because this is the key to it. Remember you're listening to a tape. You're not engaged in conversation. The word engagement, never forget that. When you're teaching English as second language, engagement of the students. And you know that, you know that teaching history or health classes or PE, the students aren't interacting. If they're not engaged, they're not going to learn. And uh, the problem I feel with audiolingual, well, I'll mention the advantages first before I downgrade it. Um, you can do it, you can teach a lot of people some language in a minimum, minimum amount of language. And, and fairly quickly. Uh, it emphasizes speaking, which is useful, instead of grammar and translation. But the problem is it's not really engaging conversation because you're talking to a tape player or you're rehearsing language that you know, may never say. For instance, there might be, this is one of the funny ones, you may get a question and you're supposed to answer and they'd say, que color es su lapis? What color is your pencil? Okay, you may answer that correctly, but the problem is, who in the heck's ever gonna ask you about what color your pencil is? Think about the odds of that occurring in natural conversation, it doesn't happen. So it, it creates an artificiality here. So you got the word engagement and you want not artificial, but genuine conversational engagement. So another word is authentic, goes with that. Um, you can teach basic proficiency, but, and, um, it, it is, it can be done, but it's not done very well. And remember, it's training and you don't even get the little lever and the little piece of cheese or a pellet coming out. So it's not like, not like I was eating a Tootsie Roll a while ago. It's not like you get a Tootsie Roll. They're pretty good Tootsie Rolls. Okay, now, what are the disadvantages of this approach? The quality of the language is sacrificed. You're not listening to natural language on the tape. And so your listening skills are very locked into this, those patterns you hear on the tape. Nothing helps listening skills other than being around native speakers. And then you pick up the rhythm and the patterns. Uh, there are no, not much nuance there. You get these chunks of language delivered to you like furniture and you're supposed to use them as a chunk. You, you don't really break them down very well. Um, it's not very interactive, as I mentioned. Culture is not taught very much. There isn't all the fun of food and music and talking to people and everything like that. That's, that's which is natural and living in another culture because you're living in a cubicle listening to a tape. Uh, Long-term fluency is not a goal. If you get it, you'll get it after you get to the country. Um, this, for many students, audiolingual is a dead end. 
you can't use it at your school. It's not going to work. Um, people will laugh at you if you've got tapes and tried to do it, approach it that way. And reading and writing, ironically, which are high skills, and were in the wrong order in the first one, you know, grammar translation, you need conversation first. Reading and writing are not, not, are not important in audio lingual. Now, they may have some program stuff where you write a few words down, but it's not really very important. So that's, that's kind of the lowdown on it, and it's pretty low. Um, audio lingual is a really antiquated approach. Um, as I give you these, I, I want you to think about what could you pull out of them and use. And audio lingual, um, because it depends on kind of an older technology, and even with computers, and you you can you can have um, an updated version and use a computer program and make it a little more interesting to follow along. But it's still, if you're not dealing with real people, it's not particularly useful. Um, I often think that uh, with the grammar translation and the audio lingual, it, they're kind of an approach. They want you to produce high level stuff with grammar translation reading and writing, which is very, you know, wow, that's pretty elite if you can do that. But audiolingual, you're not even a very good conversationalist. So neither one of these approaches are going to be particularly useful to you as an English second language teacher. But it's important to know about them because you'll hear people say audiolingual or something referring back to the past. And that's why I wanted you to in this class about introduction to TESA, I wanted to talk about the past because a lot of people just assume that conversational English was taught all along and it wasn't. But they got, they got closer and closer to it. Now, what we're going to do in the next one, which I will cover today, is, um, is conversational English and communicative is the word, meaning it will focus on actual communication in the language. This means that you, if you're a Spanish teacher, you have to be pretty fluent in Spanish. Uh, if you're a French teacher, if some of you have had a French or Spanish teacher who really wasn't very good or very fluent in the language, like if they actually encountered a real speaker, they'd be intimidated because they'd be outed very quickly. Oh, you don't speak very good Spanish for a teacher. And I've always been nervous about that because I had to teach Spanish in college one time on an emergency basis. And my, my speaking skills were fairly good, and I could teach, but if I encountered a speaker and they used slang and things like that, I was lost. Um, the one thing I did not get is I needed to spend about six months in a Spanish-speaking country, or at least three or four months, and through intense exposure to language, I would pick up, I would pick up my listening skills. But it's like listening to music or learning how to dance. You have to listen to the sounds so you can get used to them. Okay. All right. So I'm going to let this one go, and then we'll do one more, and that'll be the three for today.